Hi, everybody. Shavua Tov. We're going to get started in just a moment with our shear on the Luchot and the finger of God. I hope everyone had a lovely Shabbos and is getting ready for Yom Tov. Um, I'm going to send out this message once again uh, in the in the uh, in the chat that if anyone would like to download the handout that we're going to be displaying on the screen tonight, you're welcome to click on the link that I just put in the chat, um, and it's going to be on the uh, Facebook link or the Facebook uh, post as well. The link as well will we'll upload the share to YouTube Amir Sashem later tonight or tomorrow. All right, I think we should get started. Um, and I'd like to thank you all for joining me tonight. We find ourselves once again um, on the eve of Shavuos at a time where normally we would be preparing to stay up all night tomorrow night and have a wonderful program in shul with multiple speakers and great refreshments and watching uh, people of all different ages get together and schmooze and learn and really uh, prepare to receive the Torah together. Um, due to circumstances beyond our control, once again this year, just like last year, we're not able to do that. And so the, we've been working very hard to try and front load as much as we can before the Yom Tov so that people will have an opportunity to prepare to be alone once again over Shavuos with either family members or people that are within your bubble that you can receive the Torah with and really have an exciting and stimulating Torah acceptance experience. Um, so this year, we would normally prepare to give the night of Shavuos at midnight, but we're going to give it the night before Shavuos instead at a more uh, civilized hour of 10 p.m. after Shabbos. Before I go any further, I'd like to uh, thank, uh, with tremendous gratitude, the sponsors of tonight's Tikkun Leil Erev Shavuot Shir, Sylvia Solomon, Solomon in honor of her sister Molly Morris, Nani and Susan Beckerman in loving memory of Nani's father, Moshe Ben Shmuel Eliezer, on the occasion of his Yortzeit, may his neshama have an aliyah, Sydney and Leah Wurzberger in memory of Leonard Karapkin, Father of our Mora da Asra, may his neshama have an aliyah with my thanks. Dr. Gerald and Shana Friedman, Howard and Raz English on the yard site of Raz's father, Yaakov Shalom ben Yeshaya Halevi, may his neshama have an aliyah. Brian and Sharon Belmont with prayers for the safety of all children of Bayat members who are in Israel. Amen. Tibor and Helen Fleischer, and finally, Ellie and Sylvia Wolfson in honor of the bar mitzvah of their grandson, Yaakov Menachem Kovi, son of Jessica and Shlomo wrestler, Mazel Tov. And so let's get started with the shir. I'm going to be bringing up the information on my screen, the handout for the shir for tonight. Um, the title of the shir is, uh, let me just see, how do I, uh, let's see here. I think everyone should have, uh, should have a um, should have the, uh, the the handout on your screen. I hope you do. The title of the shear tonight is the Luchos and the Finger of God. Now, <clears throat> I guess the most basic question that I could ask you to ponder at this time is, why is it at all necessary for the Jewish people to be given a set of stone tablets to represent sort of the header ideas of the Torah? We know that on Shavuot, we did not receive the tablets. Moshe came down 40 days after Shavuot to present us with the tablets. It was something that the Jews were promised they were going to get. Hashem said, I'm going to send Moshe up. He's going to bring down tablets that engraved on the tablets are the 10 things that I've just said that you must follow, what we call the, the Aseret HaDibrot or the Ten Commandments. 
Why weren't the Ten Commandments on their own, uttered by the Word of God, sufficient to act sort of as the initiating experience of accepting the Torah for the Jewish people? I want you to ponder that question, because that's one of what we would call a question that is big adol. It's one of those larger questions that we never really ponder. We just take it for granted that the Jews had tablets, and we have iconography in our shuls. We have the, uh, even in the bayit above the Aron Kodesh, we have an image of the Aseret Hadibrot. There's tremendous art. Rabbi Metzger gave a shir uh, before, uh, you know, before Shabbos about the imagery of the 10 tablets throughout uh, art, throughout Jewish history. And the question is, why did we need it? I wanna study with you the Pasuk in the Torah that talks about uh, God giving Moshe the first set of tablets. And the Torah says, it's in Parshat Ki Tisa, this is source number one, Vayiten el Moshe kechaloto ledaberito bahar Sinai, that God gave to Moshe after he was finished speaking with him at, upon Mount Sinai, Shnei luchot ha'idut, the two tablets of testimony. So the word edut is an important clue as to why this is necessary. Let's just keep that in mind. Luchot even kituvim be'etzba elokim. These are tablets of stone that were written with the finger of God. Now, etzba elokim is an unusual phrase. And when it, we talk about God's finger, there are only three things in the universe that are associated with God's finger. And feel free, if anyone would like to shout out the three things that are associated with God's finger, please let me know. Would anyone like to unmute themselves and shout out another thing? We know that one of them is the tablets. What else? The plague of Kinin. Thank you, Eddie. Very good. From the Balkriya, Dr. Jessen, right? The plague of Kinin, the third plague, is etzba elokim hi. It is done by the finger of God, is what the magician said to Paro. What's the third one? Not something that we would expect the Balkriya to, to know automatically, but if you're a good Tehillim zugger, you should be able to say this. Can anyone tell me where else we find the etzba of Hashem associated with some, with some creation? Anyone? Okay, it's from Psalms chapter 8. Ki ere shamecha ma'asei etzba'otecha. I look at your heavens, O God, and I see the handiwork of your fingers. So apparently when you look up at the heavens, you associate the heavens with the fingers of Hashem. Now, this is such a strange phrase, the finger of God, because normally we are used to more... Uh, hearing more normally the Yad Hashem, the Yad HaChazaka, the strong arm or the strong hand of God. Etzba seems to imply something else, and it's going. we're going to have to study carefully what the finger of God is, why it's used so sparingly, and also how it's viewed philosophically. We'll get to that in just a minute. But first, I want us to take a look at the Targum Unculus, the Unculus translation, which is that seems to be an exact word-for-word -word translation of the text from Hebrew into Aramaic, source number two, that God gave Moshe train luchei sahaduta, two tablets of testimony, luchei avna, tablets of stone, exactly like the Hebrew, kitivin be'etzba'a dadoshem, written with the finger of God. So it seems that there's nothing remarkable in Unculus. Unculus has not departed from the literal translation of the verse. And if I was just reading this in the Chumash, I would say, move on, folks, there's nothing to see here. And even though at face value there's nothing to see here, the Rambam finds great significance it, for some strange reason, which we're going to have to analyze. He sees great significance in Unculus translating this literally, which doesn't seem to make any sense, but we're going to get there in just a second. Many of you know, and some of you come to my Mora Nevuchim class that I give online now, ever since COVID started, uh, we've been giving it online. And recently, before Pesach, we did chapter 66. And uh, this is a section in the first part of Mora Nevuchim, 
which deals with the Rambam's major project in the first third of Moren Nevuchim, which is to clarify uh, that God is completely not associated whatsoever with anything physical. As a matter of fact, the, the, we could talk about the first third of the book of Moren Nevuchim as the Rambam's theology of God, the way that he understands God. He understands God like, the, like a philosopher, like an Aristotelian philosopher understands God, completely transcendent and removed from this world, completely non-corporeal, that means having nothing to do with anything physical, and outside of time and space and completely transcendent. As a matter of fact, the Rambam in the previous chapter, chapter 65, uh, had just finished telling us that even the very first verses of the Torah, where it says, and the Lord said, let there be light, and the Lord said, vayomer Elohim, vayomer Elohim, vayomer Elohim, God does not speak. And the reason why this cannot be taken literally is because speech is a human construct, and it is therefore not to be associated with God. Whenever we find God speaking, it's a, it's a metaphor, it's a figure of speech. It does not literally mean that God speaks, but rather it means that God willed creation to come into being. And therefore, God does not use words. He doesn't use anything. He just created. Okay. And similarly, when the Rambam wishes to talk about the creation of the tablets, the Rambam once again feels it necessary to discuss this idea that Hashem is in no way associated with the physical world. And therefore, when he says, when he looks at this pasuk, ketuvim be'etzba elokim, that the tablets were inscribed with the finger of God, he says this obviously cannot be taken literally. God has no finger. God does not write. This is a metaphorical way of saying that God willed the, the writing of the tablets just as the, he willed the tablets to come into existence, he willed the inscription on the tablets to come into existence. That's all it means. And then he says, and that's why I'm surprised at Uncleus. If you take a look with me, or scroll down to this portion of the paragraph, uh, uh, the, to the second paragraph in, the, uh, in source number three, I'm just reading simply from the words of the Rambam that I have in English for you on the screen from the Guide for the Perplexed, Moren Nebuchim. Onkelos adopted in this place a, stranger, a strange explanation and rendered the words literally written by the finger of the Lord. He thought that the finger was a certain thing ascribed to God so that the finger of the Lord is to be interpreted in the same way as the mountain of God, the rod of God, that is, as being an instrument created by him, which by his will engraved the writing on the tablets. And I don't see why Onkelos preferred this explanation. It would have been more reasonable to say, written by the word of the Lord, in imitation of the verse by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Now, what the Rambam is essentially suggesting is that even though it says in the book of Psalms, that the heavens are the work of God's fingers, but it also says in the very same Psalms that the heavens are created, bidvar Hashem shamayim na'asu, that through the word of God, heaven is created. So clearly, there is no finger of God that creates the heavens. It means by the word of God, which I just got through explaining means the will of God. So why couldn't Unculus translate it that way as well? Now, we would look at this Rambam and say, Rambam, why are you attacking Onkelos? He's just doing his job. Onkelos's job is to translate the verses from Hebrew to Aramaic, and that's all he did. What, you wanted him to change the translation to saying, Ketivin bimelala da'adoshem, through the word of God? But he would not be faithful to his project of translating the text literally. Why are you attacking Onkelos? Now, this, if you were just looking at this one uh, snippet from the Moren of Uchim, you would be truly perplexed. Instead of this being a guide for the perplexed, you would become only more perplexed by reading the guide for the perplexed. But you'd have to take a look a little bit back 
in chapter 27 of the More Nebuchim, where the Rambam says something very bold about Onkelos. Onkelos lived in the period of the Tanaim, of the composers and redactors of the Mishnah. And so he lives many centuries before the Rambam. And part of the Rambam's project is not only to present his philosophical theology, which means to create a synthesis between Aristotelian philosophy and Jewish thought, but it is also to demonstrate that the Rambam is not innovating this project, but rather this project was, he is continuing what is a long chain of tradition of rabbis going all the way back to the times of the Mishnah, who also felt duty bound to perform the same project, which is to take the truth of philosophy and show that it is completely consistent with the Torah. And if you take a look at the very beginning of chapter 27 of Moreh Nebuchim, you will see the Rambam saying that. He says, Onkelos the proselyte, Onkelos Hager, who was thoroughly acquainted with the Hebrew and Chaldaic or, or um, Aramaic languages, made it his task to oppose the belief in God's corporeality. Part of Onkelos's project, says the Rambam, is the very same project that I am engaged in in writing this book. Just like I want to demonstrate that there's no physical attributes of God, Onkelos was dedicated to the very same thing. Accordingly, any expression employed in the Pentateuch, in the five books of Moshe, in reference to God, and in any way implying corporeality, he paraphrases in consonance with the context. In other words, the Rambam's thesis is that Onkelos always departs from the literal translation anytime the literal text implies corporeality or any kind of physical attributes of God. All expressions denoting any mode of motion are explained to him to mean the appearance or manifestation of a certain light that had been created for the occasion, i.e. the Shekhinah or Providence or whatever name you want to, to, uh, to suggest. Onkelos has a, has a habit that anytime there's a discussion of a physical manifestation of God in this world, he doesn't translate the text as this was God, but rather this was a light created by God to represent God, but was not God himself. Now, once we understand that the Rambam felt that this was Onkelos's project, now we can better understand his question. If Onkelos is committed to this project to remove and distance corporeality from God, so then why didn't he do this in translating the verse, Kituvim be'etzba elokim? Why instead did he write that it was created by the finger of God, literally? Now, I want you to note one other point, and that the Rambam does a little bit of a switcheroo. When he says that Onkelos translated it as created by the, or inscribed by the finger of God, he doesn't say that Onkelos believed that God has a finger, but rather the finger of God is a stylus. And it's, a, it's another way, it's like, almost like another way of saying that God had a tool that he used to, to engrave the tablets. That's what the word etzba means, not a literal finger, because obviously even Onkelos has to acknowledge that God has no body. That's the Rambam's assumption, but rather it means written by some kind of tool that God created specifically for this purpose. And the Rambam says, I don't understand why Onkelos felt the need to translate it that way. He could have just said it was created by the word of God. And that would have been more accurate and more faithful to his project. Now, before we go any further, I want to help us understand that many commentaries find themselves aligning themselves with Onkelos based on the Mishnah in Pirkei Avot, that the Rambam is a big fan of. The Mishnah in Pirkei Avot says, and this is in source number five, Asara divarim nivru be'erev Shabbat ben Hashemashot. There were ten things that God created at the very end of the Friday of creation, right before Shabbos came in. He created these ten things. Now, what are these things? They are the the hole in the earth that swallowed up Korach, 
they are the, the magic rock that gave forth its water in the desert, the mouth of the donkey that spoke to Bilam, the rainbow that appeared for Noah, the manna, the magical staff, the shamir that was used by King Solomon to build the temple, and then take a look at the last three things on this list of 10. Vahaketav, vahamichtav, vahaluchot. The last three things on this list were the writing and the michtav, I'm going to leave that untranslated for a second, and the luchot and the tablets. So in order to first understand this, what is, what is the whole idea being communicated by the Mishnah? Why does the Mishnah say that these miraculous phenomena were created um, at the very uh, moment of the six days of creation, instead of saying that God brought these things into existence at the particular times that they manifested in, in Jewish history? And so the Rambam tells us why. The Rambam says that part of the rabbi's project was to make sure that we understand that because God is a transcendent being and is not bound by time and space, God does not create things on the fly. God does not create dynamically after time and space have already been created. And therefore, any miracles that manifested themselves in our world at any juncture in human history must have been put into place before time and space were put into motion. And the way that the Mishnah expresses that idea is that it gives us a list of a bunch of, of, of overt miracles that God created, not at the time when they manifested in our experience, but rather he created them at the very beginning of creation and sort of put them on a timer. You know how you put an alarm on your on your, on your uh, cell phone to wake you up at a certain time. So Hashem put um, a timer on the, the, the ground that swallowed up Korach, and God said, when Korach stands over there at such and such a date and such and such an hour, the earth is going to open up. But that had been put into motion at the very, from the very period of creation. Now that we understand why the Mishnah does this, and this is sort of the Rambam's evidence that our sages were also committed to this distancing of corporeality from God, and even the tablets themselves are part of what the sages view as not in any way being indicative of God's corporeality. Now let's see how the Rambam would perhaps understand haketav, vahamichtav, vahaluchot, because there are many different ways of understanding the difference between ketav and michtav. Like Rashi, for example, understands Kitav is the writing and the Mikhtav are the letters themselves. So the alphabet themselves was created by God, and then the right, or, or vice versa, that the, the letters of the alphabet were created at the time of creation, and the Mikhtav was the actual inscription in the tablets. But Rav Shimon ben Semach Doran of the 13th century, who's a, or 14th century, who's a Maimonidean scholar, he's a, a student of Maimonides, he says that the difference between ketav and the second word is that the word ketav means the inscription of the letters, and he does not read this word as michtav, but rather as machtev. Machtev means a stylus, that God created both the letters that he was going to inscribe and the stylus that is being alluded to by Onkelos, which is called the etzba elokim, the finger of God. And God created and put all of these things into motion at the very time of creation. And when the period in human history arose for the need for those things to be manifest, God caused them to, be, to become manifest. So you see that the Rambam has support from other commentaries who, who read the Rambam's explanation of Onkelos into the Mishnah in Pirkei Avos itself. But now that we've seen that, we have to sort of figure out what Onkelos, sort of, first of all, let's try and answer the Rambam's question on Onkelos. If Onkelos is a, is a non-corporealist and his project is consistent with the Rambam as the Rambam claims, why didn't Onkelos just say that God created the tablets through the word of God, through his will, 
and not through any kind of physical association with the stylus or anything like that. Rav Chazdai Kreskes, who's also a 14th or 15th century Jewish philosopher, had a commentary on the Guide for the Perplexed that you can read in source number eight. And he felt that the reason why Unculus felt that it was important to talk about a stylus of God instead of just saying the will of God is because when you look at the heavens and you look at the stars and the celestial bodies, you might be misled into thinking that I believe in a God, but a God who basically is completely removed from our world, a God who is a God of, of, uh, of millennia past who created and then left. But the Luchot are indicative of a God who inserts himself into human uh, uh, affairs and puts things into the purview of humanity when the human being needs God's intervention. And that's why there's a difference between talking about the fingers of God when it talks about the creation of the heavens versus the finger of God creating the tablets. The tablets are indicative of a God who is part of the human experience and not just a God who created before any human beings were there to witness that creation. And that's the distinction that he sees. But the Rambam apparently still feels that it is inappropriate in any way to associate Hashem with any kind of physical instrument. And he feels that Onkelos was not faithful to that very same project, and he leaves off with a question on Onkelos. Now, before we go any, any further, I want to point out that for the sake of, of understanding this discussion properly, we have to appreciate that the Rambam some reads into another author that which he believes to be true. And many times you see this in general literature as well. I could be studying Shakespeare and subscribe to a certain ideology, and I'll, I'll look at a play of Shakespeare and I'll say, well, Shakespeare felt the exact same way, and I'll quote verses, and I'll say, this is exactly what Shakespeare means. And if we were to interview Shakespeare and we were to ask him, is that what you meant, Sir William? He would say, no, not at all. This happens all the time. Remember, the Beatles were interviewed about their lyrics, I am the walrus, and uh, they said, oh, does it mean having to do with the uh, Descartes and Heidegger and Wittgenstein and all. I said, we don't know what you're talking about. We were high when we wrote that song, right? So no one, I'm not, this is just a crude analogy, but the point that I'm making is, is that we tend to read, uh, we, re we read ancient texts and we find things that resonate with us and we interpret them in certain ways, when in reality that may never have been the intention. The Rambam's thesis is, that Onkelos is a non-corporealist. But if you look at the commentary of the Ramban, Rav Moshe ben Nachman, who lives shortly after the Rambam, but in a different part of Spain, in his Torah commentary, he is completely opposed to that thesis and demonstrates from a number of places how Onkelos was not interested in distancing corporeality from God in so many different places. For example, when it talks about God hearing, about God seeing, Unculus does not distance corporeality from God uh, when it talks about God speaking, God hearing, or any kind of sensory perception on God's behalf. And therefore, the Rambam completely takes the Rambam to task over here as well. And he even goes so far as to say, if you take a look, I, this is a very, very short abridged portion of the Ram, Ramban's commentary to chapter 46, verse 1 in, in Sefer Bereshit in Genesis. But if you take a look at this little snippet that I have for you, and he says, nahag betargum ketuvim elokim Hashem. And you find that Onkelos also had no problem anthropomorphizing God in his translation and saying that God wrote with his finger. He says, and, and even the Rambam reading into Onkelos that the word etzba is not the finger, but rather is a stylus, some kind of instrument that God created, it's not true. I'm sorry, Rambam, you're, you're mistaken. He says, because take a look at Deuteronomy chapter 33, where it talks about 
mi amino, that on God's right side, there is a fire that is esh uh, dat lamo. There is a fire that represents God's Torah. And there, Onkelos translates it as kitav yamine, that the writing of God's right hand. Velo pachad min hayamin hakotevet shetore al hagashmut. And Onkelos was not at all concerned that we should misunderstand and perhaps interpret that God has a hand, a right hand, with which he writes the Torah. And therefore, Onkelos has no problem saying that God wrote with his fingers. And fingers is literally fingers, even though God is non-corporeal, but Onkelos doesn't have that responsibility of distancing corporeality from God as you think, uh, Maimonides. And so now, here comes our question. So now we have to really try and figure out, we understand clearly the Rambam's project, and the Rambam feels that we have to distance corporeality from God. But now the question is, why does the Ramban so strongly come out against the Rambam and say that, no, it is okay to ascribe corporeal attributes to God? Does that mean that the Ramban was a corporealist? There are people who see the world in black and white and therefore suggest that if you don't subscribe to the Maimonidean view, then you are a corporealist by default. You believe that God has some kind of physical or can assume physical form and that verges on apicorsis, on heresy, on Christianity, yada, yada, yada. But, that's, but you have to appreciate that when we're dealing with these subtle theological principles, that's not, it's not binary. It's not either you're with the Rambam or you're against him, but rather we have to appreciate that while the Ramban also completely appreciated that God is completely non-corporeal, but he also had an appreciation for the fact that when the Torah and verses in Tanakh ascribe corporeal attributes to God, it's helpful for us. And it's not something that we should completely do away with, but rather we have to appreciate the function of the metaphor and how in some way it's helping us. And I believe that this will ultimately shed light on why in the first place God felt that a set of tablets was, was necessary. And for this, we have to go to Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, uh, our great teacher uh, from the Kuzari. And in the first section of the Kuzari, as we all know, Rabbi Yehuda Halevi had five essays. In the first essay of the Kuzari, paragraph 87, Rabbi Yehuda Halevi discusses the events that happened at Mount Sinai. And he writes as follows, uh, source number 10. Even though the Jewish nation believed in God and Moshe as a result of all the miracles, there still lingered in their hearts one question. How could God speak to man? That's a very basic question. How does a transcendent being communicate with the human being? They saw all the miracles, but the miracles did not indicate a very basic principle that we believe in Judaism, that God not only performs miracles for mankind, but God communicates with mankind. And how can that happen if there is such a a gaping chasm between the Almighty and the human being. And so in an effort to explain this, he says, perhaps they thought the origins of their religion were man-made, and that these origins only helped to induce divine aid and might. They had difficulty attributing speech to an entity that was not human, for after all, speech is a physical act. The very thing that Maimonides insists is something that we must distance from God, is the very thing that Rabbi Yehuda Halevi says, that this was the very problem that the Jewish people had. We appreciate that God is not a speaker. God, God is non-physical. So how does he communicate? God wished to remove this doubt from their hearts. He therefore commanded them at Mount Sinai to sanctify themselves both internally and externally and prepare themselves for the giving of the Torah. And as, as an introduction to Matan Torah, Rabbi Yehuda Halevi explains that the whole purpose of Matan Torah was to demonstrate to mankind that God is capable of communicating his wishes to human beings, and that this is not something that human beings cannot access. 
human beings can access divine communication. And so after three days, wondrous things began to happen. There were sounds and thunder and a fire surrounded Mount Sinai. The nation then heard God proclaim 10 commandments in a very lucid voice. These commandments were intended as the pillars and foundation of the entire Torah. One of these commandments was the law of the Sabbath, which had already been introduced when the provision of manna began. The nation did not receive these Ten Commandments from a group of individuals or even a prophet. They came directly from God. And then he continues and he says, and it's important to remember the difference in philosophical orientation between Maimonides and Rabbi Yehuda Halevi. And this is a perfect example of it. Look at this paragraph. He says, this type of prophecy that the Jews had at Mount Sinai is unlike that described by the philosophers, namely that the soul, when it is purified in thought, attaches itself to something called the active intellect, which we won't get into now, or to the angel Gabriel, which is what Muslims claim, who then guides the individual to prophecy. This latter experience may occur in a dream or in a state of quasi-sleep. The individual hears the words, but through his soul, not his ears. He sees the vision, but through his thoughts, not his eyes. He then attests that God spoke to him. He says, the belief of the philosophers was disproved by the great event at Sinai, which was an actual physical confrontation. It was further debunked by God's own writing in that God engraved those Ten Commandments on two precious stone tablets. He then gave the tablets to Moshe, and the people were able to see God's own writing, just as they heard God's own voice. Very different orientation from Maimonides. Maimonides believes in prophecy as an intellectual communication that is not made up of actual words, and there's no actual hearing, but everything enters into the mind, into the intellect. Just the way that Rabbi Yehuda Halevi described how philosophers believe in prophecy, but we don't believe in prophecy in this way. It is possible for a person to actually hear a physical voice of God because for Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, in order for God to be real for the Jew, there must be a visceral, feelable, touchable experience with Hashem. And that was the very purpose of Ma'amad Har Sinai, of standing around Mount Sinai and hearing God's voice. And now that we understand that that's Rabbi Yehuda Halevi's uh, um, understanding of why we had a Matan Torah, it makes sense now why tablets were really just a continuation of that objective, which is to give the people a physical representation that God was with them. And Rabbi Yehuda Halevi is a very down-to-earth, very pragmatic kind of rabbinic thinker. He doesn't believe that it's possible for most people to associate with a God who's completely removed from the physical. God is non-corporeal, no doubt, even according to Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, but he must in some way have a physical connection with humanity, and he does so through speaking with a real voice at Mount Sinai, and he must do so by giving real physical tablets that we can see and touch and feel and make sure that we understand that God is part of this physical world so that we know that he can, we can associate with him in some way. And it's in this way that if we just jump a few paragraphs later in the same Kuzari, then we understand what, uh, what was the precursor to the golden calf sin. In explaining why the Jews sinned with the golden calf, Rabbi Yehuda Halevi gives the following introduction, and he says, the nation heard the Ten Commandments, and Moshe ascended the mountain to bring down the engraved tablets and place them in an ark. The objective was to have some tangible item that they could focus upon, something that would contain a record of the covenant between God and Israel and a divine new creation, namely the tablets themselves. And the, he goes on to explain that when those tablets were not forthcoming on the 40th day when Moshe was supposed to come down, that's the reason why they made a golden calf, because they said we cannot relate to a God who's completely removed from the physical plane. You just can't. And so that's why they needed a golden calf, because Moshe didn't come down with the physical tablets. Had Moshe brought the tablets down when he promised, there would have been no golden calf, because they would have been placated in their need for a physical representation of God in their midst. 
I want to make sure that everyone is clear on that point. In a previous year, when we had a shear, the night of Shavuos, we pointed out that the Rambam has a completely different conception of what Ma'amad Har Sinai was. And we explained that if you look in the Moren of Uchim and contrast it with Rabbi Yehuda Halevi's depiction of Ma'amad Har Sinai, you will see something completely different. For the Rambam, there was no actual tangible voice. And here is where, you know, I use the analogy. If you had a video camera at Mount Sinai, and you turned it on during the utterance of the Ten Commandments, there's a big dispute between Rabbi Yehuda Halevi and Maimonides what that tape recorder would have captured. According to Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, it would have captured the fire, would have captured the sound of the shofar, the lightning, the fire on top of the mountain. And eventually that video camera would have captured the voice of God because it was an actual ontological voice that reverberated throughout the desert and perhaps even farther. And therefore your video camera would have captured the sound of God's voice, which Rabbi, Rabbi Huda Halevi suggests was basically created by God by vibrating the air in a certain way to mimic human voice. But if the, the Rambam had set up that tripod with the video camera on it, the Rambam would have told you that no voice would have been recorded on the video camera. Everything was internal. Every single Jew had that prophetic experience of understanding God's will, which translates into the Ten Commandments, but they would not have actually heard a real voice. Okay? So once we, once we read Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, we have a greater appreciation for why the Ramban, Nachmanides, is so opposed to the Rambam's project of removing corporeality from God. Yes, it's true that God is non-corporeal, but mankind, human beings, because we live in a three-dimensional physical world, we need to have something that is physical, visceral, that we can associate with to appreciate God. And this is the tension that exists within Judaism, that on the one hand, God is supposed to be completely transcendent, and on the other hand, God is supposed to be imminent, close, and accessible. And the balance that is created between these two creates the tension between a Maimonides and a Ramban and Rabbi Huda Halevi on the other side. Before we move on, or before we, before we finish this discussion, we have to explain why the word etzba, we said we would come back to that. Rabbeinu Bechaya in his commentary to uh, the eighth chapter of Sefer Shemot, where, it's, where the first time etzba Elohim appears, as Eddie Jessen had said, in relation to the third plague, he asks the question, why only by the third plague did the magician say, this is the finger of God? And he said, he says that by blood and frogs, all God did was manipulate um, that which was naturally occurring in the water and in, yeah, in, 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 this, in the river, right? In other words, God caused there to be a concentration of, um, uh, of, of redness in the water, and God caused there to be a concentration of frogs to gather all together at one place. Aval, he says, Aval hakinim bahem bria But converting earth to lice is a, is a new phenomenon. It's a miraculous phenomenon that is not just harnessing the forces of nature, but creating something new. And therefore, he says, Ulakachis kirbo lashon etzba shebiuro pele. And therefore, he says, that's why the word finger is employed by the plague of lice, because it means something miraculous, something completely departing from the laws of nature. Kilashon ha'amor begal galim, as is explained by the celestial bodies, ma'ase etzba'otecha, the handiwork of your fingers. Ki briyat ha'galgal etzel kocho yitbarach nikle kibirat kibriyat ha'yitush, because creating something ex nihilo, like creating the celestial bodies, is the same to God as creating a mosquito from nothing. The point is that they're both miraculous creations. And then he quotes Reb Sajagon, and he says, We find the word finger associated with God in three places. Galgalim, the celestial bodies, the celestial spheres, it depends how you translate it, Uveluchot and the tablets, Uvamakata Kinim and with the plague of lice. And he writes, why these three things? He says, Hagalgal betachlit hagodel, Shein Guflamaila Mimenu. 
The celestial bodies is the most impressive creation of God to human perception because it's the largest. To talk about creating planets and stars, that's the most impressive because it's the largest on the grandest of scales. The Luchot is equally impressive, but for another reason. He says, Ulamayla mehem bizohar, because even though they're small in size, they are magnificent in what they represent as far as divine illumination. And then finally, he says, why lice? He says, because lice is the, is the epitome of something that is trifling and tiny and, and small. He says, and the idea is, that all three get the same attribution of the finger of God. This is to indicate to demonstrate that they're all the same for God. When you're God, creating Jupiter is no more difficult than creating a single louse out of a grain of sand. And that's the magnificence of God's creation. And that's the reason why the word etzba is used only in these three places. The grandest of creations and the most trifling of creations are the finger of God. Now that's very helpful. That's very helpful to help us understand why only in these three places, but it doesn't really give us the full picture. Because as I mentioned before, that at least explains what these three have in common, a thread between these three. But why not say the Yad Hashem? What's the idea of an etzba, of a finger, a single finger? So I'd like to bring your attention to something fascinating that the Radak says from a linguistic point of view. If I was to ask you a question, what would you say the Shoresh, the three-letter root of the word etzba is, ayin, sadi, beit, ayin, what would, you, what would you suggest? What is the shoresh of the word etzba? And many of you who know me and have heard me talk before know that I love to go into the etymology of words. What is the shoresh of the word etzba? Can anyone tell me? Tzva? Tzva, sari bet ayin. Yeah, so it, it's from the same word. What does the word tzva mean? Color. Color. Seva color. Is a color. Yeah, seva is a color. Now, what is the what is the commonality between a finger and color? So it, it's important to, to it's really important to to underscore this that the whole idea of color is that it, it, a color is probably the most distinctive attribute of an object. Is that one of the things that strikes you first to make this object unique is its color. And color many times separates different objects from each other. Something could be white, something could be red, and it's the thing that makes is most distinctive. Perhaps that's why there's so many race problems in the United States today is because people see things with their eyes first and they fail to see the humanity. All they see is color. And that's truly unfortunate. But color does provide you with something distinctive, right? The finger, especially, and we'll see in contradistinction to the hand, but the finger implies the dexterity with which the human being creates things and provides them with his unique imprimatur. The artist who wishes to provide something unique through creating a piece of art does so with his fingers and provides something distinctive and unique that he transfers from his own skills, from his mind, and places into the sculpture or the canvas or anything else that he is creating and does so with his fingers. The fingers are the unique feature of humanity that allow us to create and create unique uh, things that are a product of the creator. And so therefore the word etzba is associated with the word seva, which means color, which be because the etzba is the instrument of the human being to create distinctive features in his work product. Now, it's also important to note that the word etzba is associated with creating physical things in this world and giving them distinct form because color is a feature of the physical world, not the transcendent world, just like the finger produces that which is physical and gives it unique and distinct features. And with this, we can perhaps understand another idea that is conveyed to us by Rav Moshe Israelis of the 16th century, who has a fascinating exposition in his introduction to the book Torah Ta'ula, 
where he gives a philosophical introduction to the idea of the korbanot, of the different sacrifices. And one of the things he notes that is truly, really quite fascinating is that there are certain korbanot that you take the blood from the animal and you sprinkle on the altar with your fingers, with your right finger. And there are certain types of korbanot that you don't use your finger to touch the blood, but rather you take a utensil like a small pail or a bucket and you splash the blood against the side of the altar without touching the blood at all. And he asks a very simple question, why is that? And he notes that the korban that is most associated with using your finger is the korban chatat, the sin offering. Whereas other offerings, you don't touch the blood, but rather you use a container. And his thesis is that the reason why you touch the blood when you offer a sin offering is because you're bringing that korban to atone for a completely uh, physical lapse in judgment. I made a mistake, I gave in to my desires, and I committed a sin that is a physical in nature. And therefore, in order to represent that fact, I have the Kohen touch his very physical finger into the blood. When it comes to other offerings that are not to atone for sin, but are rather to offer something that is more spiritual in nature to Hashem, I offer it, I offer the blood, but I don't actually physically touch it, but rather I place it in a container because a container gives shape to that which is amorphous in its, uh, it, the liquid that is put into the container assumes the shape of the container. The container therefore represents something more esoteric and that which gives form to the purely physical. And so when we understand that, the word etzba means to give something distinctive features within the physical world, we see that the Rama and the Radak are much more consistent with this idea that the word etzba implies something physical having to do with the Luchot. Again, a support for Rabbi Yehuda Halevi and the Ramban that the whole idea of the Luchot was to provide the Jewish people a physical representation. Now, now that we've presented all of this, the question we would have to really examine is, what, for the, now that we understand the function of the Luchot for us people who need you know, physical representations in our lives, how would the Rambam view the need for the Luchot? What is, what is the function of the Luchot for the Rambam? And it would seem that the answer is, is that the Rambam would view the Luchot as a concession to the human need of physicality, just like korbanot are a concession, a has, you know, begrudging concession. But he wants to minimize the amount of physical connection that God has in the universe nonetheless, and therefore he distances any kind of physical association with a divine finger. And finally, now that we've gotten into this discussion, we might be able to understand a passage in the Haggadah that we said over, over Pesach. Now, normally we read this at a point where we're ready to start eating and we're a little hungry and we're getting a little um, antsy and we don't have a lot of energy to really analyze this, but it's the part that comes after the, uh, the, the Eser Makot and, um, and after the Dayenu, so it's easily glossed over. Rabbi Yossi Haglili Omer, Minayin ata Omer shalaku hamitzvim b'mitzrayim Eser Makot, how do you know that in Egypt there were 10 plagues, but at the Red Sea there were 50 plagues? So the proof of that is, because in Egypt, the magician said to Paro, it's God's finger. At the sea, what did they say? That the Jewish people saw the great hand, not the finger. So how many fingers on one hand? Five fingers per hand. So if all they saw in Egypt was a finger, and in Egypt they saw a hand, there must have been five times the number of plagues in, in, at the sea than there were in, uh, than there were in, uh, in, in Mitzrayim during the plagues. And if, if you remember the succeeding two paragraphs, you know that it then later says, that, uh, you know, uh, the Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Akiva say that it would, there was either 200 or 250 plagues at the sea. 
because they use other multiples added to the, the, the 10 plagues. And they say that it wasn't really 10 plagues. It was either four plagues per each plague or five plagues per each plague. And then when you multiply that by five, you at the city, they got either 200 or 250 plagues. But this gets to the crux of what the difference between a finger is and a hand. When we talk about the finger of God, we're talking about a distinct, unique work product of the artisan, of the creator. And that's the way that the Torah wants to describe the Luchot, that it was indicative that God was fashioning something unique for the Jewish people. But the difference between a finger and a hand can be explained as this. Why did the Jewish people see the hand of God and not see the finger of God? For one simple reason, because the hand is representative of the conglomeration of all of the fingers. That just like when you use your entire hand, you're able to grasp the totality of something. And when you use your fingers, you're dealing with something very intricate that you want to produce that is unique. That's the difference between the finger and the hand. The, the hand, the finger produces that which is intricate and unique and distinctive, just like the distinctive colors in an object. And the hand is the overarching ability of Hashem. So now we have a better understanding of the difference between finger and hand. The, with each succeeding plague, the Egyptians and the Jewish people saw a different ability of Hashem to create and manipulate nature. But when did they see the final overarching picture? When did they see that God was not only a God who could bring specific uh, types of afflictions to mankind, but rather that he was a redeeming God, a saving God, a God who can not only um, uh, bring specific pestilence to man, but could actually manipulate nature to the point where he could drown some and save others and do and have a complete mastery over nature in its totality, that's at the Red Sea. And that's where they see the hand of God and not just the finger of God. And so just to, just to conclude, I think that we've answered some of our questions tonight. Our first question was, why do we need tablets in the first place? And we see that had Moshe not delayed just by a few hours, the presence of the tablets themselves, because they represent a physical connection between God and the Jewish people, which was so crucial for their psyche, would have actually averted the sin of the golden calf, according to Rabbi Yehuda Halevi. And why then is it called the finger of God? Once again, to try and anthropomorphize this idea to bring God and make him more imminent for mankind, as the Ramban says, I don't even accept the idea that the, Ram, the Rambam suggests in Unculus that it was a stylus. No, the Torah sometimes speaks about God in human terms and anthropomorphizes God specifically because it wants us to believe in God as someone who is a being who is close to us, despite the fact that he is completely transcendent. We're supposed to try and balance both of those ideas. For the Rambam, all of this is anathema. And therefore, he distances the idea of finger, and he feels that the whole idea of any physical representation or any manifestation of God in the physical plane is a concession to a, a, a human failing, our need for physical representations. But it would be much better, as the if once you reach the level of, philo of a philosopher, to distance all these ideas from God, and that's where we get this tension in this in this analysis. Was Maimon Har Sinai? a visceral physical experience, which sets the tone for all future Jewish history and knowing that God is in our midst? Or is it a transcendent prophetic experience that produces a sublime idea of, an, of, a, of God within the intellect alone, but nevertheless makes us have a relationship with a transcendent God instead of an imminent God? That's the question. Now, tomorrow we're going to be reciting Yizker together. And tomorrow, I hope to give you another idea about what the Luchot represent on a more moralistic level related to Yisker, and that it'll be the first Yisker that I say for, for one of my parents this year. And I hope to be able to share those ideas with you tomorrow evening at uh, 6 p.m. when we get together and have our Yisker service. Are there any questions or comments that anyone would like to make at this point before we, uh, before we tune out? Okay. Okay, let me wish you all, since we've just finished our hour, 
And normally, if this was Tikkun Leil Shavuot, we would tell everyone to please go get a cup of coffee and some refreshments and come back for the next year. Unfortunately, there is no next year, at least not for tonight, but I encourage you all, please spend some time over Shavuot, the night of Shavuot, make Kiddush late, wait until Tzay Tako Chavim, wait until nightfall, um, and make Kiddush for your family, have a meal, and then study Torah as late as you can, and let's reaccept the Torah together. Thank you for all being with me tonight. I really appreciate the opportunity to share these ideas with you. And we'll look forward to tomorrow morning. There's going to be a Seum for the Brotherhood in memory of Rabbi Rosenberg that we do every year. That's at 10.30 tomorrow morning. And then tomorrow evening for, uh, for Yizker at 6 p.m. Thank you, everyone. Shavua Tov, Agute Vach, and a good Erev Yantuf. We'll see you soon. Take care now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you.